Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, March 26, 2024 study session of the Olympia City Council. For the record, we have a quorum with all council members present this evening. Uh, and with that, I need a motion to approve this evening's agenda. So moved. Second. All those in favor of the agenda signify by saying aye. 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 We have an agenda. So we have two items uh, for business uh, this evening. Uh, item 2A, which is a briefing on food security and urban agriculture, uh, followed by uh, item 2B, a briefing on urban farm park feasibility study. So we will begin with item 2A. Um, the food security and urban agriculture briefing, uh, beginning with Mackenzie McCall uh, from the Thurston County Food Bank uh, to begin the presentation. Hello, I'm Mackenzie McCall. I'm the agricultural resources supervisor at the Thurston County Food Bank. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I have been farming since 2008 and I've been with the food bank since 2015. The focus of my career has been on equity for both farmers and consumers. Um, the Thurston County Food Bank was founded in 1972, and although our mission remains the same, to eliminate hunger in our local community with a strategy of neighbor helping neighbor, we continue to evolve to meet the changing needs of our community. We do this through eliminating access barriers, prioritizing health and children, and rescuing good food from going to waste, and we do it all through partnerships and collaboration. Not only do we serve Thurston County, but we've expanded our capacity as a regional distribution center to meet the needs of Kitsap, Mason, and Lewis counties. We do this with support from the National Organization Food Lifeline, regional organization Northwest Harvest, and we have many programs and financial support through the Washington State Department of Agriculture. Our warehouse regional distribution center was established in 2014. It allows us to receive and redistribute food to our pantries and our extended network. Volunteers at the warehouse sort food and build boxes for our partner sites and programs. In 2022, we distributed over 5 million pounds of food um, to all of our partner agencies. Uh, in order to eliminate access barriers, we have multiple ways that we do this. One is having accessible food available to clients uh, Monday through Friday through our two food pantries, one in Olympia and one in Lacey. We have 17 satellite partners. Slow down. Oh. oh. <laughs> I tend to talk fast, so I'm not, I'm used to that code. Um, <laughs> um, so we want everyone to feel welcome at our food pantries. It's important that people, um, we, don't, we don't have any income requirements for people using the food pantries. Um, it's very common that many people in our community find themselves needing to use a food pantry at one point or another in their life. We don't want people to have to make the difficult decision between rent and food, gas and food, or any other hard choices on a limited income. There's been a gradual increase um, in our community reach from serving 15,000 households in 2016 to, oh, sorry, I think this was an old, okay. So from serving 55,000 individuals in 2016 to um, just about 62,000 in 2022. You can see that we've had a spike in 2020 um, due to effects from the COVID pandemic from uh, decreased employment and limited supply chains. Um, but we were able to rise through government grants to be able to meet the needs of the community. We expect to see numbers from 2023 and 2024 increase due to, to increased cost of living in the South Sound area. There is a strong need for children in our area to be fed, 42% of those that we serve are under the age of 18. 33% um, of elementary students are eligible for free and reduced lunch, as well as 31% of middle school students and 23% of high school students. So through the agricultural programs at the food bank, we are, we are recentering food security through the lens of food sovereignty, which enables people to have control and access over the, f the way that their food is produced, as well as healthy and regional food. And we want to do this through enhancing regional food channels, client health, and client accessibility to affordable food in the community. Our programs through which we do this are the Olympia Qantas Food Bank Gardens. We purchase food from local farms and as well as glean food from farms. We also glean food from the community fruit trees and support community gardens and residential growers. 
Our freezers and coolers at our two pantry locations and at our warehouse allow us to accept and redistribute fresh produce to the community. And our amazing nutrition education team, uh, d they do food demos and um, recipe cards which help our clients know how to eat and cook with regional and seasonal produce. And our school gardens program helps educate kids from a young age. Here's just a snapshot of all of the produce and fresh uh, local food that was distributed to our food pantry in 2023. We purchased over 50, or, yeah, we purchased over 43,000 pounds of food and we donated, we, we had, we received donations of about just over 54,000 with 71 total producers contributing to um, support our mission. It's just an, Farmers support it through both purchasing food from farmers, helps to support the local food economy, and farmers are often excited to be able to partner with the food bank to be able to not only sell their produce to us, but also give their produce to us. Farmers are often find themselves in that low income bracket as well, and so they understand the need more than anyone. And here's a slide of all of the farmers that we currently partner with. We have uh, about 17 farm partners. With the WSDA food purchasing grant that we received in 2020, we started with just one uh, partner Kingfisher Farm um, that we were purchasing produce from and now we have uh, 17 partners that we get produce, milk, beef, um, even chef cheese from our local farm partners and our clients continually voice how excited they are to be able to, to receive the fresh products um, and the purchase is also allowed to meet us to meet the cultural needs of clients as well. So community gardens not only support the food bank by um, giving food to the food bank, but they also support us through, they support the community through providing green space for individuals to grow food. Um, and we think it's important that everyone has access to fresh space to grow. And then on the right, you can see a list of all of the food bank gardens who um, donated food to the food bank uh, in 2023. I'm gonna skip this video because I don't wanna take up all your time, but if you receive these slides, I really, I highly suggest you watching it. It has some really nice imagery um, from our Lacey Farm Stand, which is open on Saturdays at our Lacey Food Pantry of all of the produce that comes from all of these different programs. And if you ever get the opportunity to come and visit us, it's a great place to see clients just really enjoying that the opportunity to have fresh produce. Um, the school gardens programs help to educate youth from an early age and develop healthy eating, and nutrition habits. Um, they, sorry, these are the old slides, so I'm hesitating. <laughs> um, so they, uh, our school gardens program has been successfully run for over, well over 10 years. And not only do, does it help to get kids out in the garden to learn and to, about how to grow food, but it also allows us from the food bank to get into the schools and reach people where they're at and to destigmatize using the food bank for families. And of course, we couldn't do any of this without uh, community partnerships and collaboration. In fact, we have so many partners that we couldn't list them all on a slide. We had to be very vague and with the amount of partners that we have, because if we started listing individuals, we would most likely leave someone out. And of course, we couldn't do any of this without volunteers. We are a volunteer-run organization, and it's the incredible support of our community that allows us to continue to grow and meet the needs of our community in very unique ways compared with other food pantries in the country. Um, so where do you come in? We want to see more community gardens and green spaces in Olympia with increased resources for people to grow their own food. This will improve the mental and physical health of our community. We need more farmers, especially socially disadvantaged farmers. We need policies that make it easier for farmers to grow food in the city, which Nora and Tina will talk more about in their presentation. We need more support for school gardens so that there's continuity between invested parent and teacher turnover. And lastly, this might not seem connected, but transportation was the largest barrier for accessing food and social services for our clients in 2023. And so anything to be able to improve public transportation would also help to serve our clients. Thank you for letting me come and talk and for your support, we couldn't do without you. <laughs> sure, thank you so much, Mackenzie. Um, before I turn it over or open it up for questions, uh, could you just repeat um, what, your, what your needs are? For, yeah. for everyone. We were all trying to write them down real quick. Yeah, yeah sorry, yeah. I didn't have a slide for it, so <laughs> thank you for saying that. <laughs> um, so more community gardens and green spaces. 
increased resources for people to grow their own food, so access to plant starts and seeds and compost, things like that, irrigation. Um, and in alignment with that, Nora Tina will talk more about this, but policies that enable people to grow food. <coughs> um, support for farmers, specifically urban farmers and socially disadvantaged farmers, BIPOC, veteran, women, LGBTQ, disabled farmers. Um, policies that make it easier for farmers to grow in the city, food in the city, one of the biggest barriers being water, cost of water and space, um, cost of land. Support for school gardens and improved transportation. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yes, Council Member Cooper. Thank you, Mayor Payne. Uh, Mackenzie, I'm curious if you are aware of a community. So in my day job, I look at the co what it costs to live in community, and we're looking at new data that's going to come out in a few months that will show, likely show that the cost of transportation and the cost of food have jumped again to, to a point where we have this cluster of housing, child care, transportation, and food, mm -hmm. which are costing average families more than a thousand dollars a month mm -hmm. and so I'm curious if you know of a community like ours in an urban environment that has used urban agriculture and or other tools at scale to actually stabilize the mm -hmm. cost of food that per the third of families that are struggling to eat mm -hmm. I would love to look into that and get you get back to you I don't the, the thing that, that's what I that's what yeah, I want to invest a model in. yeah. for sure yeah no I can definitely look into that I mean the thing that pops up into my mind is Scandinavian countries that have like more like localized um, community blocks with okay. um, access to like farm food and um, social services. So that, that's the first thing that pops to my mind, but I would definitely, um, yeah, be interested in looking at a model that I could get back to you guys okay. on. I think the, just a comment for my colleagues, in, in, in 13 years of doing this, I've spent a lot of time in the childcare space, a lot of time in the housing space, a little bit of time in the transportation space, but I think food is the cheapest lever. Like I really do think that there's not necessarily food shortages. Mm -hmm. And so if we can figure out how to bring a food subsidy to our community in a different way, it will be way cheaper than the housing conversations we're having and put money in people's pockets. Well, and that's what we're trying to do by supporting the viability of local food economy through supporting local farms, because we're able to do that as a nonprofit. So we purchase food from farmers at, at market price, and then, um, and then we give that food to free for our clients, but we don't want it to end there. We want that money that we're able to invest in farmers, especially socially disadvantaged and, and new beginning farmers, to be able to help them leverage their business to be able to um, continue to grow their farm and their business, and, and do, doing that through partnerships like Thurston Conservation District, Enterprise for Equity, um, other, I think partnerships are key in this whole equation, so it's that we're all talking with each other and that we're coming up with pathways to be able to get to that end goal, which is, affordable food for every, so it's farmers making money, consumers being able to afford the food, and we can do that through these, through the nonprofits that are already, already subsidizing um, food through these grants that we're getting through the WSDA. And I don't know how long we're gonna be able to see, we're gonna see these grants for, so I, that's why I think it's really important in the next couple of years, while all, all this additional money is coming in, that we leverage it to be able to start to create the food system that we want. I'm really glad I asked you that question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, before I go to Council Member Madrone, uh, could you just state what your position is with the food bank? I don't see it here on the staff report. Yeah, it's uh, Agricultural Resources Supervisor. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Council Member Madrone, followed by Council Member Gilman. Yeah, I wanted to offer another example of something, you know, at scale, I assume you mean like community wide, right? And um, you know, actually right up north of us in Pierce County, um, the city of Tacoma works with the Pierce Conservation District. They have a program called Harvest Pierce and there's dozens of community gardens across Tacoma. They have an MOU between the city and their MPD and the conservation district to provide them with the resources to help establish community gardens, maintain community gardens, help recruit, train volunteers, all of that. So, you know, that's a lot of what informed what we're gonna hear next. But there, there's another example that's just, just north of us. 
Can I just make one more comment? That working in this community, I feel like there's so much potential and that's why I've stayed here after graduating from Evergreen in 2017 is because I feel like there's potential for us to be the example for other communities. And so I'm excited to see where this work goes and I feel very hopeful about it. I just to sort of follow up on um, Jim's question about you know the scale I'm wondering about need and it's a little bit stunning I, I live right by Garfield and so to hear that Garfield's at 61 percent free and reduced and 15 years later those families are still at 31 percent free and reduced at Capitol High School um, so how do you have a sense of how close between the pantry and the local produce program that you come to meeting the food gap for those for two thirds of young families? Um, we meet we meet their we meet the gap through the food pantries. We don't directly do service into the schools. Getting food into schools is its own program, and there are mm -hmm. school there are farm. Uh, farm to school programs out there, especially through, I think Southwest Washington Food Hub has a program yeah. that they run where they get food into the schools. And there's programs like the Freedom Farmers, Olympia High School, which are actually growing food for school production. So if I, if I may, I'm actually mm -hmm. asking at the mm -hmm. elevator speech for the food bank uh -huh. level, how close does the Thurston County Food Bank come to meeting the needs of the people who are um, burdened or challenged to to meet their food. Oh yeah, I don't have that statistic right here, but it's, I think we would need like, I think it was like $18 million or something to be able to like actually meet that need. And do you have a ballpark of what the current budget is? Um, it's over 6 million, I know that. So like three times what you're doing yeah. now. To reach yeah. The, I was just hoping to get some scale. Sure. It's, it's stunning, we sort of normalized, we mm -hmm. call it low income or free and reduced, but if it's two thirds of the families in my neighborhood, it's mm -hmm. everyday life. It's not a couple of special situations, right? Right, and th I think that again goes to like community, reaching people through the community because we can only do so much at the food pantries themselves, but then it's creating systems to where we are going into, we're getting food into the schools, we're getting food into the neighborhoods. Maybe it's opening up more local neighborhood pantries to be able to get people food. Um, but no, it's a huge need and we're only able to, to sort of, yeah, I, I would say about a third feels about right. Wow. What we're able Thank to do you. Right and, now. And Council member Cooper helped me out earlier this week and said, people need more money. <laughs> <laughs> Always more money, yeah. <laughs> cool. Any other questions? All right, so I am going to turn it over now to uh, Nora Carmen White uh, from the Thurston County Conservation, Conservation District. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. I'm Nora, I work for the Thurston Conservation District. Um, I am the communications and education manager. I've worked there for just about eight years. I also have a master's in community food system resiliency and I'm a local farmer. I raise livestock uh, for lamb and poultry and also for value added wool products. Um, and you wanna introduce yourself first? Sure, hi, um, I'm Tina Wagner. I'm the community agricultural programs coordinator, which is a mouthful. <laughs> I've been with Thurston Conservation District for a little bit over two years. Um, and um, I have a master's in um, environmental studies that I did at Evergreen, but I looked a lot at kind of a climate and climate change and mitigation, different things. And I worked a lot with soil organic carbon and kind of where agriculture can really impact climate change. And so that has really informed what I'm doing for Thurston Conservation District. I'm also a master gardener and I've been one for over 12 years. And I work with Nora in communication and education and outreach and we do a lot of programs in the community. So both Tina and I work at the Thurston Conservation District. We're one of 45 districts in the state of Washington and over 3,000 across the country. Districts are non-regulatory entities that help community members access educational services, technical assistance, financial assistance to be good stewards of our shared natural resources, kind of as a big umbrella. So food production really naturally falls underneath that. Um, and also oftentimes we're looking at sort of those places where there can be mutual benefits of ecosystem benefits, community benefits, uh, food system resiliency, community resiliency in general. So that's sort of like the district nexus that's pretty special and unique. Uh, so we've been working with the city of Olympia on urban ag stuff for a number of years now at this point um, through our urban farmland work group and um, our coworker Adam Peterson did a number of really amazing GIS analysis reports 
for y'all around uh, farmland, potential farmland in the community, and then also kind of expanded that um, to look at sort of all of the different aspects of urban agriculture and access to those, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, through those, we've developed some series of technical recommendations, and that has developed into the scope of work that y'all have so kindly funded the last two years for us to engage in this work with you. Some of that also grew on some really great partnerships that we've had with other cities. In Yelm, we used funding from the National Association of Conservation Districts to develop the Yelm Community Garden. It was a really great sort of micro example of partnerships like Mackenzie was talking about that was the city of Yelm, us, uh, Bounty for Families, which is a nonprofit there, the school district, the tribe, uh, a ton of veterans organizations to build this really beautiful community space. And we thought we could do more of this and it would be really great to engage additional municipalities in doing that. And so that was some of where I came in and, and stepped in after Adam had done that GIS work with y'all to say, we can do a project like this in Olympia and it would be really amazing. Also, like I mentioned, sort of the bread and butter of districts is that we offer this really individualized technical assistance and we do that for many of your community members through soil testing, access to low cost farming equipment, and just coming out and looking at someone's property with them or the site that they're growing at and helping them problem solve and helping them connect with financial resources like NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service funding. They have a ton of funding for urban and, and far, um, beginning farmers and doing things like high tunnels or um, managing livestock in small spaces in a way that's really beneficial and safe. So, we bring a lot of expertise in those areas to our work with y'all. Um, so looking at a little bit more around urban agriculture in Olympia, I don't know if you all know J.W. Foster, former mayor of Yelm. He was really supportive of our work in that Yelm community garden. And he was like, take this picture of me thinning radishes. Um, <laughs> he was really hands-on. It was really amazing. Um, so we, um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what do we mean when we talk about urban agriculture. Similar to Natural Resources Conservation Service, we use a really broad definition of urban agriculture uh, because that way it can capture the most in one definition. Um, so when I'm speaking about it, I'm thinking about practices of farming or gardening within an urban environment, no specifications around scale or production for retail necessarily. So people can be home gardening, but they also might be like a for-profit for production farm, or it could be a food bank garden. Um, there's not those kinds of specifications on it. Um, and this can also include things like livestock. Um, and like I said, we're often looking at where those, there can be other ecosystem benefits. So inclusion of things like pollinator habitat can be a huge side benefit of, of things in urban agriculture. Community agriculture is important for, or urban agriculture and community agriculture is important for a lot of reasons. Um, it increases access to growing spaces, including things like community gardens. This is shown to increase things like property values, mental and physical health for residents, access to nutritious food, and has the potential to mitigate a lot of local impacts um, for climate change. In Olympia, this could be like reduced runoff and uh, mitigating for sea level rise. It could also contribute to cooling in urban centers, reduction in pollution, things like that, increased pollinators and wildlife within those corridors. Urban agriculture spaces um, such as school gardens and community gardens are often in neighborhoods and they're really crucial, crucial to closing that gap between ingredients and food. So I think it's really interesting to think about those spaces as supplying one of those and then through things like partnerships, creating the other. I think some of your questions are sort of getting at that also. It's like, we can give people food and how do we make that, we can give people ingredients and how do we make that food for people and doing that in a way that is um, culturally relevant and supportive. And community gardens can be a really great space to do that in, but also having a diversity of spaces that people are getting food urbanly, whether that is through a food pantry or an urban farm that they can purchase from or purchasing directly from other farms in the community as well. Um, looking at some of the GIS work in the city in particular that we did before, um, I wanted to call out some of the things around community gardens. Um, and through that, those GIS reports, which I would really encourage you to take a look at in full, um, community gardens really rose to the top as an area of impact and action that would support a broad part of the population while addressing a lot of inequities in access to green space, fresh food, and supporting climate and well-being. I wanna just pull a few quotes in particular from the report that Adam did. 
Uh, he wrote, community gardens were one of the more rel relatively uncommon agriculture resources across the city. Compared to other agriculture resources considered, community gardens were sometimes some of the smallest in size. In our data collection, these collections, these locations were often some of the easiest to find information about and appeared to have a high level of engagement from the community, despite their often smaller sizes. For many community gardens across the city, ac accessibility via roads with sidewalks was relatively limited. In some cases, surrounding roads with sidewalks were present, but small gaps in the road network provided connectivity barriers. He also went on to talk about how a lot of the location, there's some really great maps in there about the locations of food resources and community gardens being one of those, um, decreased when you looked at things like income and BIPOC populations as well. Um, in particular, in some portions of the city, there was like really little access that was accessible, especially by foot. So great talking about transportation that you brought that up also. Um, thinking about who's involved in some of this work that we do, I, I really cannot emphasize the partnerships and our partnership with you has been so important on this, but working with the food bank, this year through our contract with the city, we're doing sub awards to Grub and South Sound YMCA for just being able to offer additional support and a wider variety of services. Um, and Tina will share a little bit more about what kind of what those partnerships look like in action this year especially. Um, and then thinking a little bit more about um, how the city of Olympia can support urban agriculture, we'll talk a little bit more kind of about the work we're already doing and, and where we see this moving forward next. Um, we, we were doing a lot of planning in 2022 and 2023, and then out of the blue in late 2023, the opportunity to do some work on the ground and get the ball rolling uh, rose with the Olympia Community Court Garden. It was a garden that had been started in, I think, 2016. Um, it was both a garden space that gave people access to food and the chance to grow, to grow food, but also to serve their community service hours in lieu of other kinds of ways of um, fulfilling their obligations. Um, and it was thriving and beautiful, and then COVID came. And the gate uh, just to the right in the picture with all of the people in the upper right was locked, and no one went in for several years. And so we did two work parties. We worked with community volunteers that ranged from high schoolers to a couple of city council members. Um, and we, did all, we took about 2,000 pounds worth of weed um, and overgrowth out and cleaned everything up, rebuilt the beds that needed to be rebuilt and brought in fresh soil. We had wonderful compost donated by Silver Springs, which was great. Um, we also had um, people, uh, we had one of the uh, CTE teachers from Capitol High School come out and helped build the beautiful compost bin that is there and said, you know, my students love to do things that are on the ground. And so they have been working and they, you can see in the, the third picture, um, that's one of three um, potting benches that they made that will go into the greenhouse there. In fact, I think I might go pick them up tomorrow. They're ready to go into the garden. Um, they're also building a picnic table and they built a compost sifter, which is also a produce wash station. So they're, you know, they, they're hands on doing it. Um, we did work a lot more with the GRUB and the YMCA to say, okay, this is what our plan is and this is how we're gonna move forward. So we were ready to, to come up with a calendar for 2024 and our builds. And um, we started, uh, stood up in April of last year, a new program called Farm My Yard, which is a matchmaking service that works much look like uh, Thurston Conservation District's existing program, South Sound Farm Link, where we try to match people that have space, in this case, a yard, an urban space, with someone that wants to grow. So it's a kind of a one-by-one a one rather than a community garden, but an opportunity for someone to say, you know, I'm not growing and maybe one of my neighbors wants to grow and then they can, w and we can support those kinds of relationships. Um, we spent a lot of time planning for our two-day food and production and climate conference, or climate change conference that happened in the end of January. Um, and I don't know if any of you got to come, but uh, it was a really great um, event. And we did provide technical assistance and soil testing. In fact, we did a, in one of our workshops, kind of a, um, a very impromptu um, demonstration of how to do a soil test and how to do a little pruning. So, you know what I mean? Like, give us the opportunity and we will step forward and demonstrate something for you. Um, <laughs> something. <laughs> um, and then this year, uh, we have been running, running, running. So this is my favorite picture in the last two weeks. On the left is a before and on the right is an after. So we've built the first of three 
community gardens in the tiny home villages in Olympia. So Quince uh, Street Village now has a garden and they're ready to go. And their site manager said, when can we do planting day? <laughs> and we said, we have to wait for the weather. So, <laughs> so we're ready to go. We're building also at Franz Anderson and at Plum Street, the tiny home villages. And so we're really excited about that. Some of the participants there are really, I think it will be a good space for them. Um, and we also potentially will be working with the Multicultural Service Center that has, houses a lot of refugees at the Evergreen Vista um, uh, apartment complex. They've had in the past a thriving community garden and COVID, as many things happen, um, kind of shut that down. And so um, it looks like there's a lot of interest. We can get another community garden and the program that goes with it started there. Can I mention one thing? Sure. Your staff in the housing team that support those tiny home villages have been really amazing to work with. They were immediately were like, oh, this helps us meet our goals for these sites and for mental health care and for greening these spaces, creating shade. They kind of brought us what their goals were for having gardens in those sites. And we we're like, okay, great. Our tech staff went out there with them and helped plan these mm -hmm. that then Tina led folks in building. And so big kudos to your staff. We've really, really enjoyed working with them and they've just like really seen this benefit right away. And I'm really excited about what will happen with these by the end of the growing season. For sure. Um, another thing that we've taken on is to add more support to the existing programs. Um, at the Olympia Community Court Garden, there's not really a body of people there that are growing things. And so we reached out to local schools and other entities and Avanti High School said, yeah, we wanna, we wanna grow things there and we can care for that, uh, Lincoln Elementary as well. And then the Olympia Community Court clients also will have the opportunity to, to do some garden, therapeutic gardening, right? Um, I think that's how it all works out. The Olympia Community Garden is a community garden that's been here since in, in the city of Olympia since 1987, is supported by Sustainable South Sound, and they've been reaching out for help. They have a waiting list and they want to add more, so that the need for spaces for people to grow is really high, and they're really excited about getting support from us, from the YMCA, and from Grub, because there's a, a body of knowledge there as well. Um, at Sunrise Park and Yager Park Community Gardens, um, I'm going to be there and we're going to work with the YMCA to bring some programming and support for people there. Um, sometimes they have clients who rent their beds and um, Luke Burns, I'm sure you know who he is, uh, says I bring in a, a load of compost and then people say I can't move the wheelbarrow. And so, you know, we can, we can, we can move the wheelbarrow for you. Um, and then with our partners, so City and with Grub and YMCA, we're doing these garden builds, we're putting in irrigation to make these really efficient um, and successful spaces. We'll be doing planting, succession planting and harvesting. And um, I know that the YMCA is super excited to do a lot of health and wellness programming at, at all of the gardens to um, help people be successful and realize the benefits of the, the urban agriculture. Um, to work with nutrition and how do you use things that you don't necessarily know how to use. Um, and we can teach people gardening skills and build those communities as well. Um, we're doing a lot of planning and we'll be doing, it, it's exciting to see the synergy between these different groups and, and what they, people have done on their own and now bringing them together and kind of spreading that out through the community. Um, and we've talked a little bit about it. The access to, to land is a problem. Um, and we do, we do try to solve that problem. We, ta we have our South Sound Farm Link program that's been around um, since about 2015. And that is more uh, rural focus um, and more kind of production agriculture focus. Um, we've pivoted and introduced the Farm My Yard program. And actually I brought postcards so we <laughs> we have handouts and you all can have them and you can sign people up um, and get your neighbors involved and share it with your people that you know want a garden and don't have a space we will we will help them out um, and get them set up we've also worked with the city to have a, a tab or link on the vacant lot registry and to look at spaces that are city owned that might be underutilized or businesses that have spaces that are underutilized and maybe they have a community within the business that wants to work on a community garden or do some urban agriculture. Um, and so this is a way that we help with the access piece. Um, we also, once again, once you bring us in, we'll, we'll teach anybody anything. So we like to offer a lot of support 
um, and to help people be successful in their urban agriculture endeavors. This is also sort of getting at some of those continuing needs and so a few other barriers and things that would be helpful to continue addressing. Uh, a lot of times when we talk about how we support people, it's through incentives and through, um, like I mentioned, we're a non-regulatory agency. So what we're doing is all carrots, no sticks. We're giving people tools and information. And I think there's a lot of room to use that model in urban agriculture. The ag meter well that is a reduced rate of water is a really great example of that. And the cost to implement and install a new ag meter or a new water meter is really high. And so in particular, like a, a landowner and farmer matched through Farm My Yard that we've been working with, he said, well, we'd really like to put in that meter. It's gonna take about 20 years for the cost of putting that meter in to be paid off with the reduced rate of water cost. So some in additional financial incentive to make the installation of those meters is a great example of a really tangible incentive that could reduce a further barrier. There's other really great examples. Uh, some cities have implemented things called urban ag incentive zones that can be a specific geographic area that you're trying to increase urban agriculture production and there can be lots of different policies that can help make that possible, increasing access to cost share, increasing access to resources and tools and the kinds of things we're offering that we, that we bring forward. Um, so some of those are things we would recommend in the future. Um, in pursuit of these kinds of opportunities, we are putting in additional grant applications right now. The conservation district is largely grant funded and that's uh, something our staff is really good at. So right now we're working on several different grant applications that would help to get at some of those incentives and hopefully those will be productive and uh, we'll get funded and we can help to trial some of that. Um, and also looking at how we can further expand partnerships as a form of solution. One way that I wanna think about this and kind of like frame it in, in the end is thinking about this um, nexus that we're experiencing of population growth. So population growth in the population in Thurston County is a little over 300,000 right now and farmland loss and access to farmland and then thus the access to locally produced food. The um, US Ag Census just came out with its county level data recently and they do that census about every five years and we lost about another 10% of farmland in the last five years is what the estimate is showing right now. I'm sorry, what was that? Right, yeah, and, and so there is, like you said, housing is a huge issue, food is a huge issue. Those two things are gonna bump up against each other without policies and programs to help support them happening both in ways that need to. Urban agriculture is such an opportunity because if you go with that loose definition that I talked about at the beginning, that is what our federal agencies that support urban agriculture use, there's a lot of opportunity for really amazing innovation to grow vertically, to grow in all different kinds of ways, is to grow in spaces and use the tools that are there to think outside the box and not think just within sort of like, well, this is what a farm looks like and this is how we have to grow food, but a farm can look like a lot of different things. The food bank is a really great example on how they glean from all different kinds of spaces. Um, so I think there's so much opportunity in this problem and I think that's really exciting. Um, yeah. This is a really nice graphic that I think <laughs> sums up sort of how home and urban gardens can have all of these different benefits and can help get at a bunch of those things. Happy to take questions too. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Wynn. Um, I have a few questions, so I guess uh, I'll just kind of, if it takes a while, we'll just, I'll stop and then we can kind of go around. Um, thank you so much, uh, uh, all three of you, for coming and presenting. Um, I certainly uh, learned a lot and uh, look forward to referencing some of these slides that you put together. Um, my first question, Nora, you ended up, you said, uh, you know, we, there's a lot of different ways at getting at this problem. Um, What's the problem? Access to food, I think. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, money is a piece of that for sure. 
Yeah. Um, but I mean, access to food and the solution to that can look like a community garden. It can look like supporting urban producers to grow within their neighborhood and be a food hub. It can look like supporting farmers by buying from our local farmers to support food bank clients. It's n- it's a no one. There's no one shot to to help that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I feel like there's these, um, possibly these kind of uh, myths that are, uh, that folks, uh, that, that come to mind for me and that I've heard from folks. Um, and, and I want to take this opportunity to ask the professionals, right? Just as, uh, you know, there are community members that don't, don't feel like there is a problem. You know, it's like, well, we have grocery stores around here, right? And so that is maybe a very simplistic way of looking at it. But I think it's important to kind of speak to that, too. Um, And then there are, you know, community members that will say, well, uh, if, you know, when we're um, thinking about people that are socially disadvantaged, right, whatever that means demographically, um, then it's like, well, aren't they too busy to grow? I've heard that actually quite a bit. You know, so I'd love if um, you could speak to that as if we – don't support this. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I would. That's something that I didn't hear in, in both of the presentations. So at the risk of getting you riled up, um, I yeah. But I, I'd like up, to, so. you know, I'd like to hear some of that. And then another one that I hear often is about like the management. Like great, the um, uh, not to dismiss any of the work, but okay, we have a whole new, uh, a bunch of plots of, of community gardens. But but then it's like, well, you know, is it you know, is that just a phase and then who's going to manage it, you know, and so, uh, and I think that it's really important to, uh, you know, to speak to some of these things, right, because we all don't have the knowledge um, uh, or understand how how these, uh, you know, how these spaces are maintained, and then uh, I guess I'll kind of stop there for a second, but, well, just to add is, like, there is more than just consuming food, right, so, like, what is it? Why is it important to you know, put your hands in the dirt. Why? You know what I'm saying? But if you could, whatever you want to um, speak to, I, I think I'd love to hear it. Do you want to talk about the first two? You really yeah, yeah. I'll, ta- yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll take it back to like a macro perspective for you. So um, thinking about our current global food system and how it, I think Jim mentioned that we have enough food, We just which is, it was a distribution issue. Um, and, the, and that what we're trying to do, so the slide that I had, which is recentering food security um, and, and onto a food sovereignty perspective. So what food sovereignty does is it um, looks at how we produce food, which impacts uh, the climate, um, which impacts individuals who are growing food. So if you look at the stores in the, gro- if you look at the food that's in the grocery stores, how is that food being produced? Where is it coming from? Wh- who, who's gaining the value from that food? And a lot of the times it's the distributors that are getting the value from the food, not the producers. So by recentering onto a local food economy, we're able to revalue the, the producers and production of the food and also um, ways of farming that um, are sensitive to the climate and address climate issues. Um, so that's, that's one. <laughs> so thinking about how we, like looking at the issues with our global food system and how food is produced and how it's accessed and who has access to it is the first part of it. Um, and then, um, what was that? Well, I'll, I'll say something. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, your second myth that you were talking about, like, oh, these people are socially disadvantaged. How do they even have time to engage in something mm-hmm. like this? I think when we first talked with the folks that manage your tiny home villages, that was a really great example because they, first of all, they lead with a trauma-informed care perspective on how that they work with their clients. And a big part of that is helping people be people no matter what circumstances they're experiencing and giving them opportunities to have autonomy and giving them opportunities to have expression. And I, I mean, how many of you guys like to cook and eat? And like, yeah. <laughs> like that's part of being human and mm. that's part of why engaging with food, engaging with food with other people, conversation over a garden when you're working with someone, what an opportunity to learn about someone, to solve conflict, to learn about someone else's culture through eating, through growing food. Like that seemed like such a no brainer to those staff. They were like, this is something that belongs in these spaces for people who are experiencing some of the hardest situations that a person might experience. 
They need access to a green space. They need access to something that's beautiful. Quinn Street is an amazing resource and it's in the middle of a parking lot. Like there are no trees. It's very hot. They have a lot of runoff issues in that space. And immediately they were like, this not only provides a source of food and activity and community for people, but it also can, we were like, how can we include shade here? So we're gonna do some domed growing structures that are gonna be places people can sit underneath that are shade that's not inside their tiny village, their tiny house or the shade that it casts. So I think just because someone is experiencing a hardship doesn't mean that they don't deserve the opportunity to get to grow food and to get to have that kind of autonomy. So I really appreciated your staff seeing that and bringing it right away and being like, this absolutely fits with our mission and how we're meeting our goals and partnering with us is one of the ways that they saw doing that. So that was really impactful to me. What was your last question? Oh, you talked about oh. management. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that is a, I think I want to talk about the Harvest Pierce County program and the MOU that they have there because that is definitely a barrier and a concern that I have about continuing to engage in this work is the um, community court garden is a really great example. It was set up, it was beautiful, it was engaged with, and as soon as someone walked away and there weren't people there to manage that space, it got very overgrown, it became unproductive, and it was no longer a space that people could see themselves engaging with. It didn't take very much to bring it back but it also won't take very much for it to get lost again. And so um, I think we have, are working on setting up for, for that garden in particular, like a sustainable management system by engaging folks at Avanti who are just up the block and Lincoln and engaging with the staff at the community court center about how they can continue to use that space for their clients. But we can't continue to play that role without there being some opportunity for us to step in. I'm really interested in future talking with y'all about the opportunity for something like a five-year MOU to in have some baseline engagement with the district to help manage those pieces. We're really good at that. We've done that in a lot of other community garden settings and we can help leverage a lot of partnerships and bring in additional funding to do that. And so that's something I'd be really interested in talking about in the future. Without continued management, those spaces won't stay productive. That's just true. That's how nature and entropy work. So definitely want want to make sure that, that there are opportunities for that and whatever that kind of shared pathway forward with, with the city would look like, I would love to talk about that more. Um, I wanted to uh, maybe address the issue about, you know, we have food in the grocery store. What does it matter? And I would say if we think back a few years, there wasn't that much food in the grocery store. There was a point at which supply chain was really, really reduced. And one of the other big issues is food resilience and a kind of a thriving local system that if there are supply, supply issues, if there are other climate related or, um, I don't want to be um, inflammatory, but you know, like there, there have been fertilizer issues with some of the kind of larger global geopolitical issues. And so having a thriving and robust local food system can kind of be an insulator against those kinds of issues. And so having that self-reliance in terms of a food system is really a, it is a benefit to the community as a whole, not just people that are socially disadvantaged. I mean, as a community, if we have a very strong and resilient food, local food system, then we're going to be a strong and resilient community. Um, I'll, I will just comment that we did see that happen in real time in 2020 when the supply chain, when the grocery store shelves were empty and the food that we did have was from local gardens and local farmers. And that was really incredible. Um, before I go to council member, partially uh, city manager, Bernie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to point out and just highlight some things that we've heard already just in this first part. I mean, part of it is just the leveraging of dollars when you think about the investment that we've made with Thurston Conservation District. And when you just look at everything that they've done and the partnerships have been created already with, um, with a small amount of funding, um, the grant support piece to go after finding ways to leverage these resources to make it go even further the partnerships with all the other organizations that you put up on that screen to help to help us get there. And then um, I just, as we're talking, I'm just writing down all the other ways and all the other community goals that this is helping us attain. Uh, it's helping us with jail alternatives uh, and community court. It's, hel it's helping us with our housing homeless response program. It's helping us with our Olympia Strong work. Um, it's, it's moving us in our climate work. Um, there's a piece there. And then this, this 
the sharing culture um, around community gardens and and this our belonging work that we're all that we're all doing together. So I'm I'm sure I missed a bunch and I was writing all these down, but uh, just I just wanted to highlight uh, just all the areas that this is touching uh, that we've talked about tonight. And affordability that was another one that's a big one. So thank you. It's really interesting to hear that perspective. Council Member Parshley, followed by Council Member Madrone. Um, one, thank you, City Manager. That was a good summary. And also, Mayor Fratem, those are really good questions. Um, I just have a couple. Um, the first one is, what would it take and would we bring a, such an offer of an MOU back to the Land Use Committee to consider? before we bring it to council because I'm intrigued by that because you're right, entropy is real. Um, and what I would hate to do is to see the good work that we put in go away. Um, so it'd be an interesting to entertain that and have maybe the subcommittee of land use and environment evaluate that for the council. I'm sure I stole council member Madrone's thunder on that one. Um, I need, I, the school district is clearly sitting on a lot of land. I rode by a piece, uh, I was on my new electric bike, riding down 33rd Avenue going towards Friendly Grove and there's this huge open yeah. land with a fence around it and growing weeds and probably Himalayan blackberry bushes and other things. Have you spoken to them to leverage farm my yard being the school district? That's a great question. That property in particular has some really bad soil contamination problems. That would be a unique problem to uh, do farming mm -hmm. on that particular piece of property. But um, yeah, I think about that all the time when I drive up 4th and the giant parking lot in front of the Knox building or the there that I think would be a really awesome spot for some really visible agriculture. We have engaged with the school district um, and we've been talking with them a lot around their existing farm programs. I think the next step would be to talk with them about how to use their spaces. They have also had their own sort of like back and forth about how to use their own farmland and the longevity of the use of their farmland for like the Freedom Farmers program and if that's gonna stick around or not and if that land is slated for something else. And so they've been kind of struggling with that internally and we've talked with them about that mostly so far. I think the next step would be to talk with them about potential mid-term use of other space. Yeah, Yeah, and I, I guess I would push to even the properties that don't have schools on them, and yeah. that's the 33rd is only one. Absolutely. And see if there's yeah. some way. Um, I just need, because I want to make sure I'm not making an assumption, exactly what does food sovereignty mean? Um, it's a bit of a controversial term, but it, <laughs> um, it means, I, oh, I wish I, I had the, a good definition on my slides. I don't know if I have one here. But um, food sovereignty is access to and individual, so food security is people's um, ability to be able to access food. And food sovereignty takes into consideration how the food is produced and what type of food is produced for the, for individual um, like cultural relevancy. Excellent. Um, I guess I had one more, and this is for city staff. Um, access to food, when you were talking about the GIS, we've got a transportation master plan that's supposed to be making paths and way, uh, can we line up that GIS with some of the, the work we're doing on multimodal um, pathways with bikes and walking and making sure that we're not leaving out some of these access points? Um, I'll respond to that if you don't mind. Uh, my name is Slavana Niehauser. I'm Director of Parks Planning and Maintenance for the record. And um, as part of our urban uh, farm park feasibility study, uh, we did a lot of GIS work and one of the layers that um, we overlaid in our mapping was transportation routes. Um, and so um, that is something that we are considering um, because we did hear about concerns around transportation. Um, and then I, I think it could even be taken a step further um, in the future, you know, when we're working with transportation on pathways and such. Council Member Madron. I've been taking notes as everybody's been speaking, so I'm just going to glance down here and see. Uh, well, I first want to um, thank you all for being here. Um, 
you know, uh, the, there, we've had some long-standing goals in our comprehensive plan around urban agriculture and food security that, you know, we've done some things here and there, had a couple community gardens, got the farmer's market, but we hadn't really been making progress on them. And it was actually the catalyzing moment for this is uh, the, you know, the planned loss of Spooner's Farm and the conservation district saying, hey, this is really good farmland. Like, you know, what, what's the plan here? Um, and I want, and you know, so we formed the Urban Farmland Work Group and it kind of it has turned into all of these really cool things. I wanna also um, acknowledge Marcy Cleaver sitting back there. She's with the Community Farmland Trust who participated in that work. Um, so it's really, it's, it's, this is such a cool moment to have all of this work uh, coming to a head. And I can also just uh, make sure to get those, uh, those GIS studies out to everybody so you can take a look at the work that Nora was talking about. Lisa, they, um, Adam at uh, the Conservation District did use some of our data from um, this, uh, our transportation planning, um, particularly sidewalk data um, to show where there might be issues with you know, connectivity or being able to walk to a place uh, safely. So that's been incorporated into the GIS analysis just in terms of access to urban ag resources. Um, I also made a note about you know, this. Uh, so you know, when COVID hit, everybody was thinking about access to local food. And like, you know, we're going to the grocery stores and we're seeing the shelves empty. And I feel like that was such an important moment and that a lot of people have moved past that and we're back to our regular patterns. We're back to this like perceived security, but another disruptive event, you know, we don't know when it's gonna happen, but we know that it will happen. Um, so that's part of it. Um, but there's also just the, the access to food grown in the soil where you live. That's just a really important thing um, that I think a lot of us um, don't get to see on a day to day, especially in urban communities. Um, and uh, there's another crisis uh, that we see in the um, census of urban agriculture, and that is that we're not just running out of farmland, we're running out of farmers. The average age of a farmer has gone up. We're seeing more farmers who are 65 and older and less and less who are 35 and under. And so some of our future farmers are necessarily gonna come from urban communities. And if people have never seen a tomato grow, they don't know what kind of work, they, they, they don't even see farming as something that they could do to help you know, make a living for themselves, take care of a community, um, then we're, we're, we're facing a big crisis. And these kinds of opportunities uh, create those pathways. And there's actually, you know, there's a lot of work going on at Pack Mountain around, you know, uh, bringing folks into those spaces. Um, uh, I also, um, you know, Lisa, you mentioned, you know, how do we get the MOU process moving? Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if that's something that necessarily needs to go to committee. Um, it could be, because there's already examples to draw on with, um, with Tacoma. So it could be um, that TCD and our staff work together on things. But it could also go through a committee. It could be land use. It could be CLIPS. This is very much a community livability thing. But I think we can talk about that and figure out the, the right path forward. But we did talk in the budget process last year around you know, a set aside in the Parks Department. It's about you know, memorial, memorializing that. So, um, so the Conservation District has some security themselves knowing that that commitment is there from us. Um, and then one other thing I noted was uh, you mentioned the, um, the um, access to water issue. And one thing we've already done as a city, um, you know, just through our rate making process is we've created a discount for uh, food production in the urban area, but you can only access it if you have an irrigation meter. You have to have that specific meter, and that is the barrier right there. And so, you know, there's two things that other cities have done to address, um, you know, access to water. Uh, one of those that I've seen is ac uh, access through hydrants. Um, so, like, you know, renting out a meter, and like, you know, somebody can plug right into the hydrant. That can ha that can work for some spots, but if you've got to cross a road, um, it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the city of San Francisco, they actually have an incentive program Well, they'll provide a discount on an irrigation meter um, for a community garden or some kind of urban ag project as long as the producer or community of producers enters into uh, an agreement on, um, you know, how they use that water and making sure that they have good irrigation practices so they're not being wasteful. So I think that that's something that we could consider to, to help get past that barrier. Um, I think that's it. 
Yeah, there's a lot of really great examples for things like that where, so we do a lot of what I call cost share, which is where usually a producer is putting forward a portion of the cost or getting reimbursed a portion of the cost of implementing a best management practice. Most often someone is required to have a management plan in order to qualify for that kind of cost share. So something like you're talking about, like this agreement about how you use the water would be a simple thing like maybe this, not simple, but... Um, like a requirement for an irrigation water management plan could be like a component that would then allow someone to take advantage of that incentive. That's how most of our cost share programs work is that someone has to be committed and demonstrate that they're interested in those management practices and ha are working with someone like a conservation district to ha have a plan for how to implement those. Yeah, and that's something that actually I think the Utility Advisory Committee, committee could take up. Uh, they also worked on the reduction of uh, ag rates, so I see that as a potential pathway. Um, and then I did see one more thing that I wanted to make sure that I mentioned, um, and that is we have our comprehensive plan process uh, underway. Um, we've had a series of recommendations that has come out of the, the, the work group who, uh, who um, you know, it, the, the work group is no longer meeting, but the, the urban farmland work group. But there was a series of recommendations that came out of that. We just heard some recommendations on the needs from the community that I know we all wrote down because we made Mackenzie repeat them real slow for us. <laughs> um, but also another thing that uh, a lot of other communities have done is um, create food plans for their community. Um, you were just at the, you know, the, the, the Music City event yeah. uh, recently, and that was out of the city of Hamilton, uh, Ontario, I believe. And they also have a really cool food plan, how to make themselves a food city. Um, and there's, there's examples all over the place. That one just happens to be a really cool one that I like. But I think that um, we should have a goal in our comprehensive plan and then start working on it shortly after we're done with the comprehensive plan to start working on what is our plan for ourselves as a city, for how we want to take care of people uh, when it comes to food, um, how, how we kind of institutionalize um, some of the things that are happening, how we support partners. Um, and I, we were having a conversation recently around like, you know, how the city of Olympia built up from, you know, the issue of homelessness and like just it started off pointing at other jurisdictions saying, oh no, it's, it's your thing to deal with, it's yours. And then eventually the city of Olympia said, oh wait, no, we have a, really, we have a role to play here. Um, and I think that we can do that with food too and really make a really big difference for people. I'll get off my soapbox now. Thank you, Council Member Madrone. Um, great segue to my comments because that's exactly what I was thinking was about our comp plan update. And, um, you know, sort of, we have it currently identified that we would establish neighborhood centers throughout the city, right? So this is sort of my line of thinking of, well, how could we, um, you know, think about that in, in, within this context about how, how are we going to make sure that we are uh, providing spaces um, f to grow food? Um, we talk a lot about tree canopy and green spaces, and so that that's the part that I'm I'm very intrigued by, and and how that could play a, a role in our comp plan update. Um, the the other aspect to this is some of all the other benefits uh, that the city manager rattled off a moment ago, but also, you know, having um, visited Grub and seeing. Um, the benefit, for example, to veterans um, and, and what it does in terms of uh, how therapeutic it can be, um, particularly for, for combat veterans, to, to have the opportunity to get their hands in the soil and, and to help uh, grow food in the community. And also, um, that's a service to them in, in a way to give back and, and also in a way um, it provides that sense of purpose that they need to feel like they're continuing to serve the community they live in. So um, it, it has a lot of all of these different benefits, I think, to prioritizing this work. Um, so I look forward to having more discussions about it. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention, too, was is thinking about um, under your um, challenges of access to land is, is thinking about the, the, the land we currently have and the projects that we're working on. So one of the thoughts that comes to my mind is Rebecca Howard Park. Um, you know, and, and the fact that we are, um, you know, sort of in the, in the midst of, of developing um, 
a plan for that space and what would that look like, particularly for, um, you know, BIPOC, uh, you know, spa in BIPOC spaces and we're talking about having uh, community gardens uh, for various communities of color that, that also want to be participating um, in, in food production and, and growth and, and in farming. And so um, that's just one example of how I think we might want to get creative in thinking about what we can do with this, the spaces that we currently have as opposed to um, always looking for those new spaces. But I think maybe we could do that too. Um, so yeah, that's um, just a few of my thoughts. And in, in terms of a, a MOU, um, I know that obviously that's a big lift. We're, I think we all can see how long it's taken us to get the CNA MOU process um, <laughs> complete. <laughs> but um, you know, I, I, for what it's worth, I, I do think it's worth some serious discussion about how we're going to plan um, the future of, of local food production for our, our city and for our community. And I think it has a ton of benefits. Uh, and so we should prioritize it. Um, and so I just appreciate you being here and, and sharing your thoughts and coming with some solutions and recommendations for us to consider. So thanks. Right. Council Member Cooper. Thank you. Um, yeah, I want to lift that up because I think this is great. And everything that happens in this program is going to be positive. But it's biting around the fringe of the need. and. I think it's important for us to finish the pilot and get some information before we say MOU again. I also think that it's really important that we figure out how to do food security planning for our city in a much better way, much faster. I mean, if we look at what it costs and, and where, where people are spending their money and where the biggest inflation is, if we don't have a plan here, we're, we're going to see the Thurston Strong needs just continue to increase. and and so. I really need to see a path forward as soon as we can. I don't, I don't have that obviously in front of me, but to getting to a food security plan for our community and and being able to understand all of the co components. And, you know, this is a little bit of assumption, but I'm pretty sure I'm right that, you know, on, only so many beds can help. But we need to get to a point where we're building small urban farms. And, you know, th those of us who, who went to Japan last year, we visited our sister city, and, and from, from the urban environment out to Kato, which is a country city, every little town we passed had a factory, housing, and farmland. And even in Kato, there wasn't a single block without a half block or a quarter block farm on it. And I think that we have to move beyond building beds that have to be replaced and build farms. And so, I love this conversation, but I want more. Can, can I just make a comment? I feel like sure. I feel like building beds is the pathway to the farms, and I think that there's a connection between all of these different ways that we integrate farm into our communities, and that by having community gardens, um, like Danny said, it's like introducing people to growing food and to the concept of growing food out of soil, same thing with the school gardens and these small urban farm plots that we have, that's gonna lead us to be able to address the bigger issue of saving farmland and increasing farmers um, through a sh cultural shift and community acceptance, so. I think losing farmland and farmers is our, is our biggest issue right now, for sure, yeah. The task in our current uh, agreement with you right, that we have right now, the task that's funded the most is the community garden one, so that's where most of our work is focused right now. We do have two additional tasks. One is the Farm My Yard program, which is about increasing access to farmland and all of the technical assistance that comes with how to use that land and also how to have like a sound lease agreement that is secure for all parties involved and things like that also includes a lot of successional planning support for those aging farmers who need to find a graceful way to step out. Um, and then the third task that's funded in there is around just increased technical assistance and support for producers who are growing in the community. Those two tasks are much less funded this year in our agreement with the city, and those would be really great areas to grow in the future as well that could help us do more than bed programs like that for sure. Councilmember Vanderpool, followed by Councilmember Madron. 
Yeah, I, I agree with many of my councilmates about having a food plan and, and getting to these goals. I do have a quick question about um, urban ag incentive zones. Can you, can you give me an example of what that would look like? Uh, Sacramento has a really great page on their website about what that looks like in their city, and that would be a great starting point. Um, I think it can be a geographic area that is uh, focusing financial assistance for people growing in that area to incentivize that growing happening. So like your example of a community in Japan that has this structurally built in to support that community, that has to be subsidized in some way. I think there's also really great examples in the Nisqually government of how they help support and subsidize growth for food for their community through their community agriculture program. I think that's a really great local government example of how a federal tribal agency government is incentivizing financially getting food to their most vulnerable community members, which are their elders. So um, there's some really great examples both locally and nationally that you can look at for government being involved. I think it's the city of Sacramento. I'll double check and I can send a link. Um, I do have another, a few questions about the uh, urban farming feasibility report. Is that now or is that a, another presentation? That's next one. Next one, okay, I'll wait. Council Member Madrone, followed by Council Member Parshley. Yeah, I just wanted to address, Jim, your, your concern about jumping into an MOU, um, you know, when we need to see the work on the ground. And I'll just share that the way it's set up in Tacoma is that they, it's, it's a five year MOU. It's not like in perpetuity. And so, you know, I think setting up um, a few years, uh, a, a, like an agreement, you know, like we talked about through the budgeting process actually of working with them, having a stable relationship for the conservation district for five years, that gives us data for five years and, and you know, demonstrates the proof of concept. And in that time frame, we can work on building our food plan and then we revisit it uh, when it's gonna be, um, uh, expiring and then say, okay, what, what do we really need here? You know, are we, are we getting what we hoped to get out of it? Is the conservation district getting what they hope to get out of it? Is the community getting what they hope to get out of it? Um, and then, <laughs> surprise, he's been listening the whole time. <laughs> um, well, and I think yeah. his hand is timely because the thing I don't know is what skill set we have in our parks department. That's the information we asked for before we pass the budget that we still haven't heard. Hi everyone, uh, Paul Simmons, Parks, Arts and Recreation Director. Sorry, I'm uh, getting over a head cold, so that's why I'm not with you tonight. Um, but I just wanted to share, um, you know, our understanding when we entered into the agreement for the, the $200,000, um, a little bit more than that, to do the, the garden beds that are currently being built, and we saw some of those and they're looking great. Um, well, my understanding was part of that agreement was that we would also be supporting the ongoing maintenance and care of those with about $50,000 a year. And so as a part of that, we'll be developing an MOU um, likely for, you know, at least a few years, um, if not five years, that sounds like a good model. Uh, but we'll be looking to build that into our budget and working with the conservation district to put that in place. So um, that, that would at least get a baseline um, set for this year. And then as we continue to grow and learn more, we can always reevaluate those things moving forward. So I just want to offer that. Thanks, Paul. Feel better soon. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'm hanging in there. I'll be, I'll be good tonight. Yes. <laughs> Council Member Parsley. Well, and I just want to say yes to food plan. I, th I love that idea. And, and immortalizing it, at least for the next um, cycle for comprehensive plan. Um, I'm just, and maybe this has already been thought of, and I'm sort of looking at parks. When we had the housing crisis, we looked at our own land and said, how much of this can we partner with other people to build housing on multifamily housing? We have bought over 500 acres based on our own PD. Not all of it is developed for parks. Is it possible for us to look at our own land and say what parcels here could be used as a pilot study for actual farming um, and work with the TCD and Thurston Food Bank on that? Because 
I, you know, I'm also chair of finance, and I don't know when we're going to be able to fund all the development of those 500 acres. I can speak to that a little bit. Um, we've actually looked at this, and I, I heard Marcy was in the room. Sorry, I, I can't see you there, but we've talked with the Farmland Trust and looked at um, other properties uh, where we could possibly do that. One of the limitations that we have in the Parks Department is that many of our properties um, we receive RCO grants from them in order to, to purchase them. That's part of our, our funding package. And a lot of those RCO grants come with um, uh, compatible use and long-term funding obligations. And so um, some of our, prop many of our properties that we own aren't eligible. Also, m we have over a thousand acres of open space. And so um, quite a bit of our property are covered in open space. That doesn't mean all of them are. There are a couple of properties um, we've looked at one on 18th Avenue. That's the one that we talked about in partnership with the Farmland Trust. There's also, we have our Chambers um, property as well. The challenge there is getting access onto the property and then also the utilities set up. So we do have some properties that could definitely be considered for that sort of thing long-term, um, but we would need to work through the long-term grant obligations and the and, and those come with deed of rights on those properties. So. Um, we would need to make sure that they're eligible. And then the other part of it, again, is, is going to be getting utilities, which has been the barrier, which is why we typically haven't developed many of those properties, if that makes sense. Sorry if I jumped around a little bit. Thank you, Paul. Good answer. All right. Any other questions or comments before we move on to our next agenda item? All right. Thank you so much again. Um, You've given us quite a bit to think about. We've got our work cut out for us, so thank you. All right, so we're going to move on to item 2B, uh, which is the Urban Farm Park Feasibility Study Briefing, uh, which will be presented to us by, by Silvana Niehauser, Director of Parks Planning and Maintenance. So thank you, Silvana. All right, good evening, Mayor Payne and council members. I appreciate um, you having us here tonight. For the record, my name is Silvana Niehauser and I'm the Director of Parks Planning and Maintenance. I'm here tonight to share with you a briefing on the Urban Farm Park Feasibility Study. And um, to do one of these feasibility studies, you know, we've got a team. So um, while I was, uh, or am, the project manager on this study, uh, Paul Simmons, Director of Parks, Arts and Recreation, um, who you heard from earlier, he provided direction as well as feedback. Um, and Laura Keehan, who's our planning and design manager, also provided assistance with the reviewing and uh, comments. Um, our consultant team from AHBL includes Director of Landscape Architecture, um, Craig Skipton, and then um, I've also uh, got Sarah uh, Singleton Schrodel um, on the screen. She was a, a definitely a, um, critical uh, member of the HBL team, and then um, Kira Eason was the intern who worked diligently on on this project. And then uh, some of you might recognize um, subconsultant uh, Carrie Ziegler um, with Earth Art. Uh, she provided some great um, community engagement and guidelines for the art um, component to this. And then uh, Echo Northwest um, was also one of our key. Um, subconsultants. So I want to give a little background information um, that is, um, goes back prior to the feasibility study and talk a little bit about, um, you know, the origins of this project. And so going back to the 2014 comprehensive plan, it was a really solid plan. Um, it, there was a lot of community engagement. Um, it was pretty much a rewrite. Um, so I'm working on the current update of the comprehensive plan and I can say that 2014 one is pretty darn good. Um, <laughs> and in there, <laughs> um, there's a, quite a few policies and a goal around supporting um, urban agriculture. And um, uh, here I've listed the comprehensive plan goals and policies. And so they, they really do spell out the community's desire and value around urban agriculture and making sure that um, local food production is supported and people have access to that food. As a matter of fact, we have one of those policies in our parks chapter um, as well as the natural environment. But the, 
majority of the, of the policies are in the land use chapter. So, um, so that led to, um, in 2020, Councilmember Madron gave a little background there of the referral that um, ended up going to land use and um, to protect farmland or mitigate the loss of farmland. And um, that led to the formation of the Olympia Farmland Work Group. Um, and uh, while we're less structured, we, we still get together quarterly, um, but uh, this consists of the Conservation District, so Thurston Conservation District, the Community Farmland uh, Trust, which Marcy is a member of, and um, as well as city staff. Um, so Leonard Bauer and Paul Simmons and myself have all been part of that. And really, uh, the focus is on policy that supports sustainability, conserving uh, agricultural land for farming, economic vitality of farming, and um, really supporting farmers who want to farm. Um, and they put out a few reports, and I would be more than happy to share those um, if anybody's interested. Um, but the, the one that led to this study was in 2022, and there was a, a list of recommendations that the work group had provided, um, and it was shared with the Land Use Committee, and one of them was to um, conduct an agri-park feasibility study. Now we changed the name a little bit because Tenino is developing an ag park and it's like a business park. And so I heard some pleas about changing the name because this was really confusing and the community was like, wait, this is already underway. Why are you kicking this off? So uh, we did change the name to Urban Farm Park, which a couple of people were like, well, what does that mean? You know, are we gonna have a full fledged 20, 30, 40 acre farm in the city of Olympia? I was like, no, 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 no. We're using the broader <laughs> agriculture term that uh, was spoken to earlier. So, um, so with that, um, we uh, we hosted a few meetings, brought stakeholders together. They, the stakeholders and the folks in the community that were interested in being a part of this urban farm park feasibility study helped to create the request for qualifications that went out and. Um, and we also, um, they helped us with reviewing applications as well as doing the interview process. So it was very much involved from the get-go with the community and with our stakeholders. And then fast forward to May of 2023, because sometimes it takes us a while to get contracts in place, um, <laughs> a little back and forth, back and forth. Um, we ended up getting our contract uh, approved in May of 2023 and hired HBL to do this study. So I'm gonna turn it over to Craig um, and let him take it from here. All right, well, thank you, Savannah, so much. Sorry. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Craig Skipton. I'm a landscape architect uh, with AHBL and very excited to be with you here tonight. Um, I uh, have had the privilege of working on this project and um, with Sarah, uh, my coworker at AHBL. Uh, and I guess one thing that I wanted to start by saying is that there's, um, there's something that's said about design uh, in planning, I think is, is uh, akin to, to design, but it's the first sign of intention, right? So I think it's, it's really um, compelling to hear the conversation that's been going on um, this evening because I think the, there's, a, there's a really nice crystal that's forming. Um, so uh, yes, we started on the feasibility study and I, I wanted to start by re <clears throat> excuse me, reiterating a little bit I didn't do it myself. I did it with Sarah, we're coworkers, and, and Kira as well, but also with our sub consultants. Um, Eco Northwest uh, is amazing. Emily and her team have been great on for, um, providing financial data and um, information about financial feasibility um, and asking some really tough questions about what can work for, for whom and for how many dollars. Um, so, really asking some great questions. Carrie Ziegler. Uh, local artist with Earth Art. Um, she's been infusing art into the DNA of this idea of an art park, or sorry, an urban farm park. Uh, uh, yeah, she's, <laughs> it's an urm worm. Um, and, um, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, Catherine Gardau, who's been uh, with Gardau Co Consulting, she's been a great sounding board for our team. She's got a lot of deep roots in urban agriculture and farming in the state. Um, and then also, I feel like it's a rock star. Um, at least in this crowd, but Adam Peterson was on our team too. 
Um, so uh, he proved uh, essential in helping us analyze data, um, and we'll get to that here in a minute. But um, so Adam Peterson with Thurston Conservation District too. Uh, right. So when we started, we uh, had a, a, a tall order, right? I think the, the um, RFQ that came out included a lot of um, ideas already formed. And the, the idea of an of, um, agri-park then and, and now an urban farm park now was, it was, it seemed straightforward. But to us as a review team or as a team responding to that, um, we wanted to dig in a little bit. So we actually proposed a slightly different um, assembly of how this might come together. And so we started to dig into the project thinking about phases. Um, and we went really through this discovery phase into the process because we knew there was a lot of deep history about this conversation in the community. And um, we didn't know what that conversation was, but we weren't sure everyone was on the same plane as well or the same field, if you will. And so we wanted to make sure we understood and also others that were, we were asking information of understood where others were at as well. So we called it a discovery phase um, to really put our arms and minds around this idea of what is an urban farm park? And what does it mean for Olympia? Um, so that was where we kicked off with the, the discovery phase. Um, and I'll, I'll go into there. So for us, this was essential. Like This is where our research began. This is where our engagement with the community began. Um, and we asked, started asking some of those questions of, of balancing and understanding what people's understanding of what an urban farm park is, um, what are the gaps um, for, um, what could be a, an urban farm park and how people's work is addressing those gaps or where those gaps might be forming. Uh, so part of our, a big part of our uh, initial research in our dis of discovery phase was about precedent studies. We wanted to look and cast a pretty broad net um, to understand what's going on in other places um, and then also help us inform what could this possibly be for the city of Olympia. Um, the, the net that we started with was a farm in Indiana uh, that was actually included in the RFQ. It's ca actually called an agri-park as well. It's an amazing example. Um, it, it is in Indiana, and so we wanted to find a more local example um, that, that matches what uh, a farm actually looks like in Puget Sound. Actually, well, in this, you know, Washington State, um, in western Washington, and then ideally somewhere in the Puget Sound region. So that was... Um, uh, what we started looking at is pulling I ideas and examples from around the region. Um, and from those examples, which are, are in our report um, a little in a lot more detail, and they'll be a, in a lot more detail in our appendices as well, but we, we started to see themes, right? There's ideas of these precedents that, that form um, uh, some ways to compartmentalize and understand what they are and what they do as an entity. And that was helpful for us in this discovery phase to help us understand, okay, well, do we, are we talking about a commissary kitchen farm? Are we talking about a conservation farm? You know, all these other pieces and, or combinations um, as it applies to, to this project. Uh, and then we started engagement and started talking to people. And, and really, um, again, this was um, started with our stakeholder workshop. That was an in-person event. We hosted, we had a, a great community there. Um, and also wanted to, to really uh, get an understanding from these folks, because these folks are in the trenches or in, in the gardens, uh, really growing the foods and, and doing the, this work on a day-to-day on -day basis. So really reached out to these folks first, as well as conducting um, smaller group or individual interviews with people, really wanted to get on a personal level, to get past the potential group dynamics and just go right to them and ask them what their opinions were, what's their ability to take on extra work, understanding like what that might mean for their organization um, if they were to take on extra work. Um, so really dug into that and got some great, had some great conversations um, and really got to know the community at that, uh, or at least the stakeholder group at the workshop. From there, we also had some more themes, right? So we're trying to coalesce information so some of these themes that came out of this conversation were about education. And these also identified, started to identify some needs for this place that, known as the Urban Farm Park. So um, youth education, event space, a commissary kitchen, tool share, um, culturally appropriate foods, um, free food was also mentioned quite a bit, and land access. Again, that's a, a theme. Um, 
And then, so for this, that got us from the discovery phase. Now we have a, a firmer, a more firm, I should say, uh, understanding of what that um, urban farm park might mean. And that allowed us to, to further our community engagement and actually go to a wider um, network of people and ask them about what this might mean for them. Uh, at this concept refinement phase, we uh, created some narratives, really as a test fit for people to um, help them understand what this urban farm park might be. And so we, at um, Arts Walk, we were asking people, which narrative, you know, read through this narrative and what feels right to you for an urban farm park in Olympia? And um, got some great feedback um, with a lot of people that night. It was very fun. Um, and that continued on into um, our online survey. Um, we had a, um, an arts workshop as well, arts visiting workshop, and, and other tabling events where we outreached for our online survey, but also in taking input from people as well. Um, and so the survey data was, was different than the stakeholder workshop, right? This is actually a little bit wider net of people, wider um, um, group of people, um, that was on the engage um, our engage page um, for the project, um, and we feel satisfied with the results. We feel like we got some great information, um, and we had over 200 respondents, and it felt like it was a, a wide range of people that were responding, um, and uh, and it wasn't. I'll say this too: it wasn't statistically valid. It was more like a questionnaire. So I think it's it's important to keep that in mind. But um, we did get a lot of great responses from folks. And then um, looking at that data, I feel like the, the one, resp or you know, I think it's great to point out that this information, um, there's a lot of nuances to the information, but I think that the, what we felt promising about this idea and the respondents was the, the affirmative or the supportive um, versus the non-supportive. We wanted to give space, space for people to um, voice that opinion, right? So give that a chance to say, I support this or I don't support this. And that was in our survey. And the overwhelmingly, the responses were supportive. I just wanted to point that out. Uh, and then from the uh, survey also, we, we got some other information that we also fed into the, the, the design process. But farmer training, huge. Um, youth education, also paramount. And also thinking about climate adaptation and resiliency. Um, that came to be a, a, a top um, piece for us to consider. Other pieces that also played into uh, a bit of the form giving, right? As a landscape architect, I'm always thinking about creating place. And um, these are the pieces that are meaningful to a design side that give form and shape to uh, a place. And so an incubator farm, um, these are amenities that actually take up space. Um, so an incubator farm, a community garden, a uh, demonstration garden, and a commissary kitchen. Those came from the survey was, was highly rated. Uh, and then just to point out some themes, these are just some quick quote, quotes that came from the, the survey, and I think um, and they might be big enough, they're just barely big enough for me to read, so I think um, th the summary of those is that there's three things, right, th that come from these quotes. People really want a place to learn, and, and in this case, learn about farming and food production. Um, they also want a place that feeds them and restores them. That was a, a big deal. And the other one was people want a place for connection. And that we heard a lot. It wasn't just about connection with the land, that was huge, um, but with each other, right? There was a place, a desire for connection and connectivity with neighbors and other community residents um, within the city of, of Olympia. So um, that was really big. Um, so then <laughs> we've been taking, compiling information all the way. And um, this is where we, began to give form to this place. And we created a kit of parts. It's included in our appendices for the document. Um, but really trying to refine this to give it shape. Because I think we started without a place. And that was been, that's been been a, a bit of a, a, a question mark. Where is this? You know, people at the Arts Walk, people were like, OK, where is it? You know, they wanted to know, <laughs> where is this urban farm park? And, and um, and so we, that great, created lots of great conversations. But um, we, and we'll get to uh, some potential places here in a minute, but um, this is what worked into our design process. Like how do you give an unknown place, start to give it shape and form? 
And so we fed these pieces into our kits of parts and decided or began deciding like how big a garden should be and knowing how a parking lot, we know that's pretty standard sizing. So we've sized a parking lot for so many cars and a covered um, space. And so, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, but um, those are in here too. Uh, and then also thinking about size, um, what focus, and, and that is about what getting back to some of those earlier themes I mentioned, what's the focus of this place? And then again, um, location, 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 right? It's always what we hear about. Um, and this is where Adam came in, um, Adam Peterson, Thurston Conservation District. Um, and uh, so we, we were super excited to work with Adam because of the studies he's done. And, um, and he has a, a great amount of information already generated. So what we are able to do is take that information, add a couple more variables, weight them slightly differently, and see how that shapes and forms into locations within the city. Um, and so a couple things that we added, I don't have a slide for this, but a couple things we added was um, the bus routes actually, um, and that was helpful because um, it is another form of, um, a super important form of transportation. Bus stops also added that. Um, and then uh, other variables that he's already had in there. We weighted um, utilities um, and then weighted agricultural soil quality as well. Those are two important factors for a, a place that's growing food to make a, a go at it and be successful. And then, so yeah, this is just a quick snapshot to look at some of those locations that showed up as, as promising. Um, in the Northwest, um, up and around Kaufman Pond, there's some potential locations that, that rank really highly as being promising for further investigation. Uh, I'm just gonna go through these real quick. And then on the Northeast, there's a several locations up and by um, Bigelow Lake and the Bay Road Corridor. There's actually three areas up there that look promising. Um, Chambers Lake, nope, nope sorry, right. wrong page. <laughs> From the west, oh yeah, South Grass, Grass Lake area, there's a couple locations that look promising as well. Um, and on the south, Trillium and Watershed, there's a little bit of a, a, a spot that could work there um, near Watershed Park and Trillium Park as well. And then, um, oh, south, that's that one. <laughs> and then the next one is southeast, uh, looking at Chambers Lake area and um, the Yelm Highway corridor. And the next bit that we talked about and studied was operating model. This is critical, and I think we've talked about operations already. Um, and we, 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 so we looked into what, what goes into operating an urban farm park um, and what are, who are all those actors? You know, who, who's doing the work to make this place go? Um, obviously there's a landowner, that's important. We looked at the city as being the landowner, as being for this study. Um, so that was kind of an easy variable to work with. Um, but then who's a farm operator, thinking there should be a farm operator based on our precedent studies research. Um, it seems like that's a really critical piece. Um, and then thinking about these other pieces, maintenance, of course, um, the place has to be maintained um, and there's pieces and components that fall into that category. Um, and then, so yes, um, we got to so produce some visualizations. So we wanted to see what this place might look and feel like. Um, we <laughs> well, came up with three options. So uh, there's a small, medium, and large, and you can get fries with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Wedges. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right, from the farm. Um, and so we wanted to dig in because a visual, right, a picture says a lot more than you can say. Um, but we wanted to take and put these pieces from our kits of parts together to look at what see a small, a medium, a large size urban farm park begin to look like. Um, so this is the small option. Um, and this size range is three to five acres. It can fit in a lot of different locations throughout the city, um, but some of the major um, amenities that we have in this plan are event space, and it's a covered outdoor event space, um, a tool share, a shed, um, and a garden bed. Um, and so we, we have costs ranges for all of these and for development as well, um, which are generalized development costs that include purchase, uh, land purchase as well. 
Okay, so that's the small option. The next one, and oh, and this is what it begins to, or could look like. We wanted to, to get, give a sense. Uh, I think this is a, one of the more familiar, uh, like community garden scale um, that we've all seen and, and been to as well. So just an image to help what that might look and feel like. Uh, this is the medium size or medium size version, um, six to ten acres. You know, a little bit bigger, um, and it's got a few more amenities. This one actually um, has a kitchen space for food prep and food um, production um, or preservation, um, and then it's got some larger plots. It has raised beds or garden beds, excuse me, but it also has some larger, um, maybe more traditional in-ground farming techniques for row crops. Um, similar to that. This also does come with a little bit larger price tag um, from three to $15 million in, in um, including the land cost as well. Uh, and this is what that could look and feel like. You can begin, begin to see some of those um, other areas that are needed for growing on a, a larger scale, high tunnels for um, season extensions. Um, you know, part, that's part of that learning process of Yes, you can farm year round here, and this is a great way to, to do that. Um, yeah, so just some really fun visuals to see what that could look and feel like. And then the large scale, this is 10 plus. There's not too many places where you can get 10 plus acres of land in the city of Olympia, but there are a few, and those highlighted areas do include some of those areas as well. Uh, and this one has a lot more amenities to it, um, as you can see with the bigger size. I forgot to mention this at the first couple slides, but each of these does include an art component. That's the, the purple pieces. Um, so that's been planned into this project from the beginning. Um, this includes two miles of walking paths, right? And so you get more of that engagement of other opportunities, um, that park side of the place with the, the farm. Uh, and then for this one, there is a larger um, price tag too. Uh, look and feel of that. Uh, just thinking about bigger um, production, more gathering space. This is a, a bigger community hub, um, maybe uh, larger sheds to, to small barns, um, some temporary structures as well. Um, orchards become possible at this scale, um, a lot more community um, opportunities for that. Okay, and then that brings us to the feasibility section of this conversation. And I think as of right now, our report is saying that it's not feasible to develop the urban farm park as we've discussed it so far. But we're also saying that it is conditionally feasible if these conditions are met. And I think that's um, a big part of the, that ongoing conversation is how do we get there and, and what are those pieces in play to, to the levers that we can pull to make this, this park feasible. Um, and so we have conditions um, for our feasibility and condition one really is about prioritization. Um, there's a lot of um, ongoing plans uh, for parks and um, there's a lot of conversation that's already in, been in process. So um, I think finding a way to enter the urban farm park into that conversation is, is a, a first uh, critical condition. Uh, the second one, um, we have seven, but I'm not going to go through seven, all seven total, but we have seven. Um, so the second one really is getting to those partnership levels, identifying that operator. That is what we see as that critical actor that, that's um, the next critical piece to making this feasible. And then three through four uh, is about funding and finding dollars to support this. Um, that's, um, that's a critical piece. And then five through seven, um, thinking about ways to, to creatively bring this together. Um, this is uh, phasing, um, continuing that master planning process through that design, because we, we don't have a master plan for what a, this urban farm park could be. We still have lots of sites. There's, there's a next step for um, selecting a site, getting further into the design process, and moving down that, that, that road as well. And that's part of this condition. All right, so this brings us to next steps and opportunities. Um, and I just wanna mention that we took this to PRAC on Thursday. And uh, though PRAC did not provide a formal letter, um, 
you know, they were very intrigued by the project and they recommended that we further explore this project, um, particularly with the next parks plan public engagement to further prioritize and scale this project um, among some of the other commitments. And I'll, just as an example, um, some of the commitments that we have underway are uh, the armory and we have future phases of that. That's a, another phasing project as well as Yelm Highway. Rebecca Howard Park, which was mentioned earlier, um, Karen Fraser Woodland Trail, Future Phases, and uh, Lily Road Neighborhood Park. So, um, you know, we, we don't have this particular project um, prioritized in with some of these other projects that we have, so that would be something that um, we would need to do and, and PRAC had recommended um, that we do that. And in the meantime, um, there are things that we could do before we kick off the next parks plan, which it feels like we just adopted the last one, but we're really going to start that public engagement in the 2026 because we really do put a lot of time into public engagement. So we usually do about a year and a half to two years of public engagement on um, the parks master plan. So in the meantime, um, if we have staffing capacity, we could start working more diligently with potential partners to identify a stable partner and develop some framework for selection of a partner. Um, we've done this with the Armory developed framework and done partner selections. Um, and then really work with the partner to evaluate what their needs are. So that could help us with design and size, um, you know, the, the scale of this project. And then we could enter into an agreement um, with the partner. We could also start creating a funding strategy and identifying a site for acquisition. Um, so these are things that could happen between now and then should we have capacity, but as I've mentioned, we have a lot of things underway that um, are nearing development um, that really are taking a lot of our staff time. Um, so I, this may not be a popular thing to bring up, but I'm going to say um, I, <laughs> I want to acknowledge that I know that the 2025 budget is going to be really difficult for you all, and um, there's going to be challenges. However, with our current staff capacity being stretched thin over multiple projects, um, we would be putting forward a funding request for a staff position that would then um, be able to support the body around urban agriculture work. Right now, Scott River is the liaison with the farmer's market. Um, Luke Burns has the community gardens project, but then parks maintenance is responsible for maintaining them. I've been working on this project. Leonard was working on the contract last year. I'm overseeing the contract this year. So we've, while there hasn't been any particular dedicated staff member to this work, we've kind of taken it on in our different areas um, throughout the city. But I think if we really want to focus on moving some of this work forward, that's a pathway that we see. Um, totally open to other ideas. <laughs> City Manager Bernie. Thank you. I, I just want to highlight this um, request from staff. And, and yes, uh, our future budgets are going to be challenging. But I think that trying to get a larger project is going to need, we're going to need to work that into the up upcoming parks plan project. But I do think there's an opportunity for us with some staffing support to start down a path of moving in a direction so that we're ready to seize upon the next park plans process. We've talked about, um, you know, potentially expanded MOU with conservation district. Um, we just, we're going to need some more staffing help to try to work all these issues and keep them on a path. Mm -hmm. And I've seen lots of great head nods from council as we've gone through this conversation about wanting to keep this work moving. So don't have numbers, don't have any of that for you, but I just wanted to highlight that I, it is something I've, that Paul and I talked about and I think would be kind of the next logical step for us to continue this work uh, into the future. And I've put together a, a timeline um, of, you know, what we think could happen in, in what years, um, you know, just to give you an idea of what this would look like. Um, and I think, um, uh, like our city manager said, that, you know, if we had the capacity, we could start doing all this prep work ahead of time so that, um, you know, when we, we get to the planning, the parks plan, we can really be ready to launch. Thank you very much, Silvana. And Craig, thank you. <laughs> Councilmember Parsley. 
Actually, I think Vanderpool had his hand up first. My apologies. And then I'll go. Council member Vanderpool followed by council member Parshall. Yeah, I'm chopping at the bit for this, honestly. <laughs> uh, I like when I see when I see uh, land use stuff. I'm like, ooh, look at models of this. Uh, so um, I do have a, a, a few uh, questions about this and some thoughts that I was going through as I was studying this the other day. So um, as I was looking at it, I noticed that there's, of course, parking is expensive, right? And I see that as, as if we make a larger scale, the more parking is going to be more expensive. But I also see the issue of accessibility. And I think to myself, Right, how much bicycle path and walk access path could we build instead of massive amounts of parking? And I think about that because we're currently looking at our current parks and we're saying, okay, we have access problems, right? So thinking about what we choose to build for, for the parks, as especially if this is into the future, is a very important thing to think about. Um, beyond that, when I was thinking about where do we put these things right, obviously we should try to um, have access for our neighborhood centers and other projects. But I also think about some of our sprawl problems. And I think of like, does this fit into a model of using like green belts, like some cities use as saying, this is the border between the urban area and the countryside and creating a park in some of those areas where the county meets the city. Right, instead of, you know, and that may be harder to access, especially if it's on like weird bordered areas because it's not in an urban core. But I think of if we're gonna look into the future, we should think about where would the natural barrier be, right? Um, that's just, and then so for some reason in one of the recommendations was like camping and RVing. I don't know if I'm a fan of that per se. It's kind of an interesting idea because People don't. People love doing that around here, and it, having them do it in their city rather than driving further distance is kind of an interesting idea. But I, I don't know. It, um, so yeah. So it's really about that access question, right? And how much of that will make that investment? To me, that's not really a question, but I would like to know your thoughts. Um, I, I like the idea that you have around um, where the county meets the city and we already do invest in the urban growth area so it would make sense and the reason we do that is because eventually you know we plan for the annexation as our city grows and and we want to have parks that would conserve you know our city and if we wait um, you know until it gets annexed then we're competing against developers and you know other things so so we try to plan out ahead to purchase um, property there so I think that could be very viable to have um, you know uh, something along the, those edges um, also could serve as a gateway into the city as as well um, and then I think anything um, that would be located in an urban, more dense area makes sense to minimize parking. And um, I mean, some parking will be needed for being able to, um, you know, bring in supplies and things like that. But um, I, yeah, I agree with you on that um, piece. And you know, we've talked about access and we've talked about pathways and making sure that things are in locations that would make sense for people coming into the park and whatnot. As far as the RVing thing, I, that was an idea to bring in revenue because uh, we were trying to figure out how it could not have to be 100% subsidized um, sort of uh, park amenity and that, you know, thinking about different revenue opportunities. So event space is one of those. Um, renting out the commissary kitchen, um, classroom space is another one. So, um, but yeah, I, I agree with you that about the RV and the camping. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I, to add on to that, you know, when we were looking at some of the models and we're looking at like these walking paths, you know, a lot of pe some people park, do a little walk because they can't walk in their neighborhood. But if we do it on as a green belt, people could use that as a means of getting to one side of the city to the other, right? Like our current paths. So just a thought. Thank you. Council member partially followed by council member Cooper. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going on land acquisition. It's been a question mark 
and I'm really not picking on the school district, but there is some property of theirs that I just can't help but wonder if you couldn't marry some multifamily housing with an agri, urban park, I'm getting it right, um, that would provide potentially for affordable housing, not only a green space, but an opportunity of education and going to food sovereignty. Could you marry on, say, a 22-acre piece of land in West Olympia? Um, and then also looking at our, I know that our parks director came on, but marrying either what we have already bought with this idea so the land is not the issue versus also land that we're earmarking and looking at for multifamily housing. Is there space to combine that effort with that idea separate of the school district? Um, and then my last, I guess this is my second to last uh, point. In the GIS, was Adam only looking at property that was not owned currently by the city or was owned by the city and partners? Um, he was looking at property that was not owned by the city. We have distance from existing community gardens and distance from existing park properties because one of the thoughts was this could serve some of our areas um, where we don't currently meet our park standard um, or we don't meet the half mile walking distance for the community garden standard um, as well. So that was in a uh, council resolution back in 2017. Um, and so we were looking at new properties in that sense because we know there's also needs there. We, a lot of our properties that um, we currently acquired, like Paul had mentioned, um, are acquired for a specific uh, type of park, neighborhood park or um, open space or whatnot. We have a few parks that are a little bit flatter and open where we wouldn't have to log them or you know do things like that that would be highly unpopular um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and probably not very good for the environment uh, but so we have a few that could fit but it yeah. the problem is is that we haven't master planned those parks so we don't really have an idea of how that could fit on there with the neighborhood park or how it could fit doesn't mean it's off the table it just means that um, you know we didn't dive deep into those ones um, as far as the school district goes so <laughs> I've been having some conversations with them about some of their vacant properties and they are open-minded and we do have a great relationship um, with the school district so I would say that's worth further exploration I don't I didn't bring the housing thing into it though because <laughs> so you know I'm not quite sure um, how that would be received just wondering if there was a way to leverage purchasing land that has a dual purpose, both yeah. affordable housing and a park. Yeah. yeah. And that might get us to a park property, at least acquisition quicker, because, um, yeah, budget is a big idea. And this, sh this should be um, another carrot to the community of the things that we're looking at and doing that would incentivize additional revenue streams into the city shall I say, or the word levy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Craig, I'm curious, and I apologize if this is in the report, I didn't get as much reading done as I would have liked to this afternoon. Um, is it, do you study a level of service that we would need for this city? Like how many acres of urban farm park would, would meet the needs of the 50 some thousand people that live here? Did, did you get into that kind of a of, a, of an approach? The quick answer is no. Okay. Um, we looked at um, the potential for an urban farm park in the city of Olympia, but not as a level of service um, meeting the demand or or we're trying to get a sense of demand, um, but it wasn't uh, statistically valid. So it was really just trying to to get information in that process. Okay, that's really helpful. But I think that that level of service does get back to the parks mass or the uh, the parks plan. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> I just slipped my mind. But it does get back to the parks plan. And so the idea is this is a park, and so keeping it within in that uh, frame of reference, then it it is intended to meet 
the park's level of service. But when you start bringing food into it, you're talking about a different set of needs as well. Um, so it gets a little bit muddy. Um, but so level of service, we did try to locate this um, in relationship to other parks um, by distance. That So that was another variable that we did study in the GIS study. I really appreciate the way you answer questions. <laughs> You're a good speaker. Um, so just in my mind, I'm thinking, like, you probably need a, more than one, right? Like, because you don't want people driving between them. And, and, and it, my mind goes back to our previous conversation about a food plan that I think is the core to this conversation. If we have a food plan and a plan to build, like, the anchor farm or whatever that turns into, or in, in my mind, I'm, I'm thinking, like, let's say where those properties are so we can start working towards them. Like we know Chambers property was a farm. It has some capability, maybe even water, right? And what, you know, could we build the small like letter Kenny produce stand with some beds and then go to the medium and then go to the large on that property while we have like a, a west side conversation as well. And I also agree with the city manager and you know, Silvana and Paul's concerns about projects and workload. But I wonder if we're in a bigger food emergency than we are a housing emergency. Like I really do. Like the inflation of the cost of food is gonna be moving people out of our community. That we need to work here. Mm -hmm. Like we have to have those low wage, we want them to be higher wage, but we need to have those entry level service jobs living in our town or it's not feasible. And to me, food is a huge component of that. And so I'd like to get to a place where we have a plan and a, a plan to have a plan <laughs> as soon as we can, and then really look at where, where does this conversation lie with our housing work, how much we're investing. We've created a department. You're talking about how to do that in the parks department. And I, I just feel like we need to more quickly figure out a way to get to the planning. And then what's the, you know, what's the funding source, right? Like, like we need a, a dedicated funding source to food. If we're gonna come up with $18 million a year to fill the gap or whatever that is for the city of Olympia. And so I want this to be live and I want it to be live in a different way, a more emergent way. Like it's not about building a park, it's about building a food system. And I think that's what I think Council Member Madrone's been trying to get us to say out loud as a council. <laughs> <laughs> but, but all of my work around costs, it's like, this is way less expensive than everything we're doing to help the people that need us the most. So I, I, I'll get off the soapbox, but I don't think we have time for that. City Manager Bernie. Sorry, I'm just over here just marinated on everything you just said. So I think we also also look at the totality of the infrastructure that we need to create a food plan, right? So linking these two conversations together that we just had tonight, you know, on the one hand, you know, creating an urban farm park or more than one urban farm park. So there's a, a significant hub of activity to make things happen. And then also throughout the community, we're still gonna have the need for community garden space and other spaces to do smaller work. So I think with a, with a position or some dedicated resource, it allows us to do the plan for the plan that you're talking about, allows us to start saying, how do we link all of these pieces together, get a bigger picture concept for what we need. And as we start moving towards the parks plan, we have some of those components to inform that conversation. And so I, I definitely think that there's just a lot of pieces here and it can seem very overwhelming. Um, when you think about the need, eight, $18 million, I heard that and I, I almost fell out of my chair, right? But it just, it, just is a, it just highlights why this conversation is so important for our community, as you, as you all have been saying. So I'll just stop there, but I just wanted to speak to what you said. Thanks, Eddie. So Manager. we can declare an emergency next week. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Council Member Cooper, your point's well taken. Uh, I, you know, plan and then park almost seems it, it more intuitive uh, to me. So um, yeah, for what, I've, for what it's worth, I, I think that that's sort of where my head is at as well. Um, Council Member Gilman, followed by Council Member Parshley. Thank you, Mayor Payne. 
Um, I like it when the city manager says add a position as part of his <laughs> comment. Um, and it's, it's, it's because this work over, over several years of talking about it, we've had, um, well, first Luke almost a decade ago starting as a very small part of an FTE on the community gardens. I think it was like left forearm down to hand. Totally. It was just a little <laughs> bit. And, um, and now with, with Luke and Scott and Silvana all having a piece of this, but they've all um, taken on uh, a lot more responsibility within the department. The idea of having a person who consolidates that work and is, is finding synergies between these different ag-related projects, I, I think would really help to charge the effort. And, and it's also a way to talk about this as being additive rather than saying it's gonna take away from recreational uses of land or it's gonna take away from capacity to plan the development of parcels we've already you know, got a, a schematic for. Um, so I, I think that's a really good conversation and I, 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 I really believe that a, a staff person focused on this could, could move us in, in both of these projects we've talked about uh, tonight in a long ways. Um, a couple of narrow questions about the ag park. In, in earlier iterations of this, like during the last park planning meetings, there was some concern about um, edible landscaping and the public coming through and grazing. And I know that the, um, the Kelsey Blueberry Park in Bellevue has people grazing. The Curran Orchard in University Park has people grazing. Um, and I'm wondering, how is that sitting with parks leadership at this point? Because I know it's a, it's, a, it's a new territory for people who've been trying to keep people out of the fruit trees in parks. So, so uh, we don't try to keep people um, from, from gleaning uh, for personal use. We actually have a policy, and I have to apologize because it gets misinterpreted a lot of times. It's called an edibles policy. This was in place before <laughs> marijuana was legalized, okay? <laughs> so it's about edible landscape. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's been in place for quite some time. Um, we've, on the Rebecca Howard property, we have beautiful fruit trees um, that we prune and, um, you know, they, they produce an abundance of fruit. We have um, out at Friendly Grove lots mm -hmm. of fruit trees um, that are out there. One of our landscapers um, plants things like Swiss chard and and these kind of wild uh, variations of kale that are very colorful within the landscape, and um, because they're beautiful, um, but they're also edible. And we have folks that will um, go out to Squaxin Park and harvest mushrooms. We just ask that people don't do it for commercial purposes; that they're doing it for personal consumption. So. Um, and we are pesticide free, so that is even better. That's, that's wonderful. <laughs> so either that was my misunderstanding when we were talking about adding community gardens and edible landscaping last time, or it's an evolution, but either way, it's, that's, that's good news. And, and you just brought up the pesticide free policy that Park says. That's the other thing that um, I think it would be really reasonable to um, insist that the these projects are both organic and that they're soil building, um, both to, to model the sort of community values we have and to stay in line with, with where parks are at now uh, with having a pesticide free management plan. So um, excited about that. And when Council Member Cooper talked about um, you might wanna have more than one location, my back fence happens to be where the dog park was at <laughs> Sunrise Park when we had one dog park in the county. Um, <laughs> and so there's, um, th there is some, yeah, who brought all those dogs to Olympia? <laughs> yeah. um, um, no, I mean, it was, it's, a, it's a wonderful resource to have just as this is, but you don't necessarily, I understand, don't wanna put it in a neighborhood park mm -hmm. and have it be a draw that draws people from all across the region. Mm -hmm. um, which that current orchard is a little bit in university place. Mm -hmm. We've gone to visit that. It, it could be parked all around the block of the, the folks nearby. And then the last thing I wanted to say is in terms of scale, that the Evergreen Organic Farm that a lot of people have been at is about a five acre parcel and three acres of fields. And that's 
has a, a lot of capacity and over the 40 more, more than 40 years I've known it, oh boy. Um, you know, it's had different sizes of um, field, orchard, community garden, mm -hmm. hen yard, grew pigs there for a little while. I mean, it's, it's been a flexible use, but there's quite a bit that can happen on five acres. Mm -hmm. And that current park is seven and a half. So just as, as idea of scale, um, that's, that's where those parcels are, I think in that same, somewhere between the small and the median model there. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then um, the, the last thing I'm, I'm interested in is, uh, you mentioned the Sacramento example, and that was one of the first places I read about they're just acquiring a piece of land and then contracting right away for um, new farmers to, to be on the land. And so it became sort of an incubator, but also contracted out to keep the management going of the facility. And, and I'm, I'm intrigued with how that might work. Yeah, and I think key to some of those um, contracts is being able to have these long-term leases, so. Thurston County is also doing that right now. There's a property down in Violet Prairie that um, is sort of co-managed between Department of Fish and Wildlife and Thurston County for prairie ecosystem restoration. And they recently went through a bid process for ranchers to contract and do both ecosystem restoration as well as grazing on that property. And so they selected Colvin Ranch, which is actually right across the street from the property that they have. So that's a great local example of that happening also where they acquire this property and they're then doing just that. Council member partially followed by council member Madron. Well, I have to kind of put my finance hat on again and kind of bounce off um, what council member Cooper was talking about. Um, should we be looking at partnerships? I like that first step, partly because I think we should be doing an Olympia version of Thurston Strong, but instead of the economy, although it will help the economy, looking for partnerships that can leverage some of the funding on this, that can have access to grants that we won't have that will realize this faster. So, you know, I love that being one of your first steps because I think we might find that's the way to speed things up. And we can justify it through our Olympia Strong work, which says food security is one of the major problems with people in working in our community, our workforce, which is linked to our economy and sustainability of our economy. Speaking of which, how much of this can we leverage out of our economic development processes? If we're looking for between the couch cushions during this budget process, is there a way to start, you know, looking outside of just making the parks carry this, I guess, and then partnerships? And then edibles. Oh. <laughs> Council Member Madrone. Yeah, I'm really glad that Clark mentioned this idea of leasing public land to farmers because that's actually one of the recommendations that came out of the Urban Farmland Work Group was, you know, find a source of revenue, start buying up farmland at the urban edge to help create that, that you know, very clear, like, you know, where the city starts and ends and, um, and have a program to, to lease to uh, farmers and particularly farmers who have... Um, have been extremely disadvantaged in being able to access land for generations. Um, so that is a recommendation that specifically came out of that work group. Um, and you know, Nora mentioned the Thurston County example, King County, they own farmland and lease it out to farmers. They're incubator farms, they're generally BIPOC farmers, young farmers. Um, you know, and also there's another example in Seattle where the Seattle Parks Department owns um, some parks land and I don't know if there's a, like a financial lease involved but um, the Tilt Organization leases it and they have, um, they have a big farm like right in uh, Rainier Beach. Um, they have uh, immigrant communities who come in and help tend the land and they you know, have a kitchen there, everybody has dinner together. It's a really fun volunteer opportunity if anybody's ever interested. But there's, there's a lot of different ways that, um, actually we as a city currently lease farmland to Spooners. So we, we already do it. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways that that can come about, but, um, but I'm glad you mentioned it because there's been a, uh, some conversation on that uh, previously. Thank you. Um, I, I do have a question, uh, Silvana and Craig, about your uh, case studies. 
were there any examples of um, sort of speaking of partnerships that um, council member partially mentioned a moment ago about, of small or local businesses investing in something like this, particularly those that are interested in um, local food production? Wasn't a gotcha question, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I think the best example would be um, commissary kitchens um, and um, you know, those are particularly valuable for small businesses that are trying to get up and get started because those commercial kitchens are expensive to, um, you know, uh, develop. And so, um, do you remember, was it Rock, uh, what was uh, Rock, Rock Creek Hall or something? Rock, yeah, Rock Creek Hall. Rock Creek Hall, I think, and I think that's in Portland, right? Yes. So it's in the case studies. Um, and uh, they have a commissary kitchen um, model where uh, folks that with small businesses can rent the space and, and whatnot, similar to what we have with the Olympia Center, but I think um, the commercial space is a little bit more geared up towards um, the food production uh, side of it. Yeah, thank you. Um, I asked that just because a moment ago you had mentioned something about not really being sure of what the demand is. And mm -hmm. I just think that that's obviously a, um, a pocket of our community that I think it would be um, of interest to us to, to assess that, to see how many folks are interested in, in sort of investing in something like that um, for their own businesses. Um, I had a question about um, first of all, thank you for the timeline because the slide before the timeline where it was like, well, if we were a completely different city, this could happen. So, <laughs> so I appreciate the timeline, um, you know, to sort of see how, you know, we, we would do this. Um, but I, just a question around, um, you know, operations. Uh, so are, are we thinking that we would own the land, I believe I heard that, and then we would put out an RFP for a farmer that would operate this land, or, or how exactly would we, we would, go about management of the site? Yeah, so Parks is not looking to start a new line of business. Uh, we wanna stick with Parks Arts and Recreation, because um, that's what we know and what we're good at. Um, we're not the best farmers. Um, <laughs> And so we would want to have a really uh, solid partnership. Um, and I think we've got some great examples of organizations that have um, like longstanding success in this community around agriculture. Um, what we would want to do is put together some frameworks for partner selection. I think that would be important because um, we really want to get an organization that's values align with the city um, that's going to uh, you know, really put equity, inclusion, and belonging at the top of, um, you know, their values. And so, um, you know, that's a piece that I think, you know, we've got a little bit of experience in putting together frameworks with the Armory partner selection. Um, and we could um, look at that as a starting point um, and see how we can uh, modify that for this and then there would be like some sort of a agreement um, obviously in place around the farm operations but then there's going to be some shared probably site components um, that would need to be um, you know we'd have to negotiate and figure out who's responsible for what and and all that good stuff and same with development I mean if we choose a partner that's got land that's ready to develop well, maybe we are, don't want to be the land <laughs> owner in that case, you know. Maybe we want to lease part of it for a park and then help with the development of the amenities. I mean, there are a lot of different options. I did kind of fall in love with the Rainier Beach Farm that, um, and talking with um, the park staff that oversee um, that, that uh, contract with the TILF, that is one of the best um, partnerships they have, so. Tilth Alliance. Tilth. Tilth. Tilth, sorry. <laughs> All right, thank you, Silvana. Any other questions or comments? All right. 
Um, I think Silvana might have uh, beat him to it, so he popped up and disappeared. Paul, come back if I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, she, she ended up getting in there. I was just going to say that, you know, we, we don't necessarily know exactly what order things would come in, and that if a partner has the ability to financially contribute to the project, or whether that's through land or expertise in terms of operations that would help reduce kind of ongoing costs. Those are all things that we would be looking for in, in partnership. So if those things were to come forward sooner, that can drive some of the other decisions or solutions. And Solana got there as, as she was answering the question. So that's all I was gonna add to that. Thanks, makes complete sense. Council Member Gilman. Well, I'm just thrilled with the conversation tonight and, and Really excited about beginning to chart a path to move forward. And two things I just want to put on our, our wish lists. Um, one is while there's a lot of discussion about allowing people to do culturally, cultural, uh, that, yeah. uh, <laughs> growing things like their ancestors did, um, there's also value in teaching people to grow in a maritime climate things that will grow here. And so um, defining a local diet that has things not imported so far, that has a lot of potatoes and kale and berries and nuts and garlic and you know things that, that are, um, are, are suited to this place is I think is a, another kind of cultural value. Um, so I'm interested in that. And then we didn't talk about the value of um, similarly of closing the loop, the, the transportation of food, but also the transportation of nutrients. Mm -hmm. That the more that we do this, the less we send phosphorus out through the lot treatment plant into Puget Sound and then import more from Chile, right? That um, that's also super exciting to me is that we can close a, a nutrient, have our, our human bodies be part of the ecosystem here. And that would be, um, I think also a, a climate and environment uh, advantage um, for us. So, so those are just two other things that really have me excited about this project. Here's one thing I wanted to add. Um, through this work, we talked a lot with the Olympia School District and their Freedom Farmers program. Um, and they really would are looking for like a permanent site for their Freedom Farmers. Um, one of the challenges with the site that they're on is they've got uh, pocket gopher habitat and they're not able to develop and put classrooms in that space. And when we think about developing future farmers and also being able to create um, you know, jobs, entry level jobs and um, help like you know, bring up uh, more younger generation into the farming, that was an area that um, I thought is an opportunity that we could uh, explore a little bit more of how do we support that program or maybe um, you know, help the kids at Capitol High School get a similar program. They have great um, data around their success rates for students staying in school and not dropping out. And also um, they've created their own community out there. So um, just something to consider as also another possibility. Council Member Madrone. Yeah, well, and there's another possibility as well. The Thurston Conservation District is looking to uh, create a conservation and education center. So I'm, I see maybe multiple partnerships that could that could form as a result of all this. Um, but I largely just wanted to thank everybody for the conversation tonight. Um, you know, I know a lot, I know that there, there's been food security work done at City Hall that predates my time on council because those goals are on our comp plan and we do have a couple community gardens and like that, that past resolution. Um, but when I first came on to council, like, you know, right when the pandemic hit, I was like, I need something to work on. Like, you know, it's like everything's in crisis mode. I need something that nourishes me. And, um, and this work has really been um, a big part of that. Um, and it's so, beautiful to see um, all our partners here at the table and you know things that are moving forward that is really going to nourish the whole community and so i just thank everybody for the conversation and thank everybody who's been working with us on this um it sounds like there's a lot of alignment among us on, on you know the kind of future we want for uh our local food systems well said that sounded like some great closing comments. Uh, <laughs> any additional questions or comments? 
All right. Thank you so much again. Uh, with no further business before the Olympia City Council, we're adjourned.